or wait, are we? All right, this. <laughs> so as you guys have seen, this meeting's being recorded, but um, we have the option of not recording your presentation or not recording the Q&A. If that is something that you would like, we've done that with the um, some of the ASCL panels the other day. <clears throat> um, and I think, are we still waiting for people or is this everybody? I would just like to let you know, Professor Kane, that um, Professor John Shun won't be able to join us today because um, it's um, too much struggling in his time zone. It's 3 a.m. in Beijing. Yeah, so I was wondering why this panel was at, at um, <laughs> 2 p.m. Central because it yeah. seemed like it should have been in the morning. But. Right, right, yeah. And then another panelist, she's, um, so Niema, she might join us, but she's, um, so there's some electricity and also internet issue in her city, which is Taryn. So I think that's, that's not something that's okay. so surprising. But, um, yeah, that's not so. Yeah. yeah. Then among the three of us, four day will start, um, followed by me and Ima. Ima, would you like to go before me? I, I don't know. Really okay, and I that's think fine. we may want to wait a minute or two. I don't know. Have Have you guys been going to each other's panels today? Is there much of an audience, or has this been kind of a, a more of a workshop so far? Uh, it's yeah, I think more yeah, maybe more of a workshop. <laughs> <laughs> it's been more of a workshop. Okay, so I don't have any of your papers this year. We Usually submitted, they send us. Hmm? Yeah, I think, yeah, we, we submitted a paper like about a month ahead to the, um, to the event. So I'm pretty sure the organizer has everything, but just maybe didn't circulate. Yeah, so as far as I know, I have not seen any, usually they're on a Dropbox folder. And I did not get the link to that this year. <laughs> um, let me go back. If, if you guys don't mind, I would much prefer to have papers in front of me, even if I'm reading them afterwards. Um, so I'm just going to make sure that they, this didn't get, you know, miss. <sighs> would usually have found a link. Um, I see the draft program for the YCC. I see the conference link. Okay. No, that's from last year. Hmm. Let me see if I have. I just have a draft program. And I do not have a link to the Dropbox with the papers. Do you guys have that link? Um, I can I can email you right away. That would be lovely. I do have a I do have a email that I sent to the, the organizer about a month ago. Let me see if I can find that draft. Um, would you no, I mean, did they did they yeah. send you guys a link? Because usually you'd read each other's papers. I I don't I don't know if I received a link. I'm being pretty um, fed up recently, so pretty busy. Um, and Imad or, or Jordi, or our, our no. fearless moderator from U Wisconsin? <laughs> nope, there was present, I saw a file where there were, they were putting the presentations, but I did not see papers. Huh. Yeah, that's- Sorry, was that a question for me? Yes, because it usually there's um, a Dropbox link and the folder where you'd find all the papers for the YCC specifically. But I didn't find those. So I'm just wondering what was, whether oh, I the, missed them. They weren't in the notes that I have. Okay. Okay, so I can Mass. send you- I can inquire about that real quick. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess let's, let's get started. And um, if you guys have read each other's papers, we can treat it kind of like a workshop. And I will, of course, a comment from ignorance, but um, maybe give me a little bit more of an overview than you were planning. <laughs> well, Since. we know we know that we know that each other's work, but we did not read the papers. So we will be right now also understanding from each person what they're actually doing research on. So we provide comments on the spot about the research. That's more or less the idea because we did not reach each other's papers. Oh, you didn't uh, read each other's papers this year. Okay. And did you guys like organize a panel together? Yes. Oh, awesome. So we, yeah. Okay. 
kind of discussed about idea before I had Professor Kane, if you can share with me your email, then I can, if you can just tap. Sure, let me just put that in the chat. I will send you um, um, the papers that I sent to the organizer about a month ago. I, I will add, I will add Hordy's paper because that one he's already, it's already published. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. Oh, and we have one person waiting to get in. Okay, there you go. All right, so. Um, did you guys have an order that you'd like to, to go in? Yes, so Horty is going to present first, followed by me and then uh, Iman. Awesome, well, um, Jordy, whenever you're ready. Should I start? Yeah, yeah, good. So, so let me start by thanking you for inviting me here, for thinking about me in this occasion. Let me introduce myself really quick. My name is Jordi Quero. I'm, uh, I'm professor of international relations here in Barcelona, where I am currently the director of the master's program in diplomacy and, inter and, and international organizations here at the University of Barcelona. Uh, and I'm here with you to share some of my ideas that uh, were already published in an article at the, uh, the current Arab Affairs Journal uh, that to some extent were initial thoughts that I'm still struggling with, I have to say, even if the, if the paper is published. And, and it's something that I'm sti is still with me in my current research. So it makes a lot of sense for me to share some of these ideas with you and try to check what, uh, what do you think about my next steps in, in relation to this research? So really quick, I'm presenting you here today a paper that I entitled China's impact on the Middle East and North African regional order, unfolding effects of challenging the global order. And, and I'm gonna start by, by describing the initial research interest. All in all, in the, with the Belt and Road Initiative context, there is a renewed interest in China's impact on the MENA region. Uh, the numbers of, of trade relations and economic investments are totemic. So many uh, brought back China into the study of the Middle East and North Africa region, the MENA region. So in this context, I start, um, I start asking myself a few years ago what the effects of the Belt and Road were going to be, not for China's relations with regional actors per se, but on the relations among the actors in the region themselves. Hmm? Let me go back re really quick for a second. W when academia pay attention to the new US foreign policy in the region in the 1950s, the questions arising were not only targeting how, Washington, uh, how Washington's new stances were affecting its bilateral relations with the region, but a great deal of attention was devoted to how the new US foreign policy would reshuffle, would reshape the relations between regional actors themselves, between Egypt and Israel, between, between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between Turkey and the rest. So this is the intellectual niche I, I identified. Mm -hmm. Not many people seem to be asking them that sort of questions. And this is my overall research focus, as I said, in the last few years. Uh, at this point, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that, um, that I'm not a law scholar, but I'm an international relations global politics scholar. So even if my, my arguments are going to be drawing from, um, from legal studies, my proposal here is a political science one. Hmm? Um, what is the main argument I'm presenting to you here? I propose that the most important impact that China is going to have over norms and institutions constituting the, the constituting, sorry, no, this is a difficult one for Spanish speaker, constituting the current MENA regional order is not going to be through its actual relations with the regional actors, but actually through a parallel channel, namely the consequences unfolding from China's different challenges to the global order, to the broader global order. Every instance in which China might prove successful in articulating parallel or alternative global norms and institutions to those currently defined by the global liberal order could trigger deeper shifts within the MENA regional normative environment. Hmm? In the international relations discipline, one of the central debates and research questions nowadays 
um, is about what we could expect China's attitude towards the liberal order institutions to be. Hmm? Some voices, as you know, uh, are arguing that we will see a contestation and replacement process. This may be a direct consequence of an emerging new distribution of power favoring those actors who were marginal in the post Second World War context of normative inception. So now they might be willing to adapt the global order to their own priorities, to their own values and, and practices. And within this box, even uh, a minority of scholars think that this might lead uh, former stakeholders and uprising ones uh, to be drawn into an armed conflict. Hmm? Some others are talking about China being uh, what they call a modestly revisionist power, meaning a new international actor which feels comfortable within the global order and it's going to try to implement some minor cosmetic changes to this former liberal order. And a third group, and this is the one I generally include, include myself in, feels that what we are witnessing here right now is the articulation of a parallel, not actually a substitute, but a parallel set of norms and practices put forward by China, which might, which might consolidate over time. These norms I'm talking about are actually emanating from China's direct relations with international actors. So I'm talking here about um, norms originally designed only to affect uh, Ch China's, uh, the rest of the world relations with Beijing, but, and this is the important, the important idea here, they have the potential to spill over into broader political and regional spaces running side by side with uh, liberal order ones. I propose to check this reality um, in three different fields. I, I, I propose to check how this is unfolding into three different fields of reality while paying attention to um, how this might affect the MENA region. The first, the first one I propose you here is uh, to pay attention to China's challenge to the Bretton Woods global economic order. Hmm? This is the, 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 the field of reality number one that they pay attention to. The, the Belt and Road might set new governance standards for trade, for investment, and especially for monetary policies among its participants based on alternative objectives and values to those of the Bretton Woods systems. Um, as, has been, as, as it has been already underlined by Shen Wei, the, the Belt and Road Initiative might not only merely facilitate trade, but also it might socialize its participants into new and evolving frameworks that are to be established, especially around the project, obviously. All in all, what I'm trying to say here is that if trade and investment of such a large magnitude is carried out on the basis of a new web of norms and standards into which all the actors that are involved are socialized, we will face a broader normative challenge to the existing global economic order. In the Middle East region, there are three elements that might be impact. Number one, the Bretton Woods International Financial Institutions policies and their lending policies in the regions, in, in this region. So China's dissatisfaction with the Bretton Woods system, especially with the World Trade Organization, has brought it to the creation of the New Development Bank, the AIIB, and the New Silk Road Fund. These institutions do not only challenge the monopolistic, the former monopolistic position of the IMF and the World Bank, but they also propose new approaches to international aid cooperation and loans around the issue of conditionality uh, and, and how they manage conditionality. Uh, putting it plainly, they are looking for new formulas that might, um, that might go beyond Washington consensus inspired measures. And in that way, uh, we might be confronting new lending policies that have the potential ability to consolidate over time and establish new normative parameters, new normative frameworks in which MENA actors might relate with the rest of the world. 
Second element which might be impact, impacted is the post gold dollar standard and its central position in the international monetary system. Um, I'm referring here to the Juanization of the world economy. So the Beijing struggle to use the renminbi in the, in the Belt and Road in, in initiative investments um, might prove successful um, as it is also using it, uh, newly using it in the oil market and especially in the oil market futures. This Juanization of the world economy might, uh, might be something positive or negative for the region, but it might reshape its relations with the rest of the world. And I'm gonna go back into that in a minute. And thirdly, the third element that might be impacted um, in relation to the global economic order is that China seems to be putting forward new global mechanisms for settling trade and investment disputes. I know that some of the that one of the papers that we're going to be talking about in a minute is going to be about this specific, so I'm not going to stop much here. But you know that there are new courts for the Belt and Road Initiative associated disputes arising in the in the, in the last few years. China has put forward, uh, has been putting forward the blue book on dispute resolution. So they are proposing alternatives to the global uh, economic order as we understand it nowadays. The impact that these three major challenges will have on the, middle, on the Middle East regional order could be significant. In broad terms, if alternative governance systems take shape and are consolidated, and especially if they become the last resort for development and sovereign lending for many states worldwide, the states in the region, the MENA states might benefit from competition. Hmm? Uh, in any case, uh, where currently they have no alternative but to turn into uh, but to turn to the IMF or the World Bank and accept their conditions, um, in the near future, then they might be able to explore competing alternative, um, competing alternatives. Sorry, in the search of the best offer. This competition might at the same time trigger some internal reforms of the Bretton Woods institutions in governance mechanisms in conditionality. The second element, the unionization of the global economy might reduce the region's de dependence on the dollar, especially if it actually ends up affecting uh, um, oil trade relations. And consequently, it might reshuffle dependency relations with the US. The articulation of alternative mechanisms for settling trade and investment disputes also offer at the same time an alternative set of rules and norms which would allow the actors of the region to kind of distance themselves from current governance practice if they wish to do so. Everything that I'm saying so far does not involve replacing all procedures with new options but rather provide alternatives that might exist side by side with consolidated norms and institutions, offering actors the opportunity to choose for the first time among many different options. And ultimately, and I think that this is far more interesting from an international relations uh, perspective than, than from an international law perspective, uh, all this situation I'm describing here might have also a, a huge impact on the relation between the states of the region and Western powers as new actors offer alternatives in the economic and financial, and financial sphere, the traditional asymmetric relations between Western superpowers and the MENA actors, uh, what many have called an idiosyncratic element of the regional order for the last 50 years, might be finally overcome. Hmm? How can Middle Eastern actors respond to, all, to everything I've said so far? Well, on the one hand, they might see this as an opportunity and they might take advantage of every alternative presented to them. In this case, they might participate in China's broader challenge to some of the elements of the liberal order. And this could range from directly collaborating with Beijing in an effort to, to bring change at the global level to simply benefiting on specific and limited occasions from Chinese-led global governance parallel order. But most importantly, alternatively, they also might act as what has been labeled as norm entrepreneurs. So they might attempt to prevent changes from taking place. 
This would happen in those circumstances where regional actors felt more comfortable with the norms and institutions emanating from the global economic liberal order than from those uh, being proposed by China. Uh, let me give you a really quick example. For instance, uh, um, those attempts to modify the dollarized condition of their trade relations could, uh, could concern regional actors um, as, they might as they might perceive this to, to increase uncertainty levels and economic insecurity. And in such situation, it might be reasonable to accept uh, that uh, those actors might be, bad, might be more comfortable with traditional norms and they might not come side by side with China in challenging the global order. Hmm? The second, and I'm about to finish now, the second uh, field of reality that uh, I pay attention to is China's challenge to the law of the sea. Hmm? Uh, I'm not going to stop here as I know there's another paper on the issue, but I might argue that China could be willing to change at least five critical central elements of the, uh, of the international regime on the law of the sea. Number one, uh, greater oversight and control of exclusive economic zones. Number two, uh, China is advocating for a tailored, self-defined, an ad hoc interpretation of the concept of historic, historic rights in the UN clause framework. Number three, China um, is uh, extending its enforcement jurisdiction deep into extraterritorial waters. Number four, China suggests to apply straight lines in the definition of its territorial sea emanating from its disputes in the South China Sea. And finally, the, the fifth element is that China is really reluctant to submit any sort of dispute to international courts or any mechanisms of, for arbitration. So they favor bilateral negotiations with the parties involved rather than multilateral judiciary mechanisms. My point here is that if China's goal is to renegotiate the essential bargain of the law of the sea, through this patient, persistent effort at reinterpretation, some Middle Eastern countries might be good partners in that respect. They have traditionally been really uncomfortable with many of the critical elements, the central elements on the Convention of the Law of the Sea and all the rest of the normative, um, the normative, um, the rest of the norms coming after that. So in that respect, China might, um, sorry, the Middle East and North Africa countries might feel really comfortable if they see the upcoming superpower challenging those norms and they might back these reinterpretations proposed by China. The third and final field of reality I pay attention to is um, what I call the global order's liberal rights dimension hmm? and how China um, is challenging these liberal rights dimension. Most of the Middle East countries and China, how should I put this? They face similar challenges in how to improve the rule of law, how to improve individual liberties and governance mechanisms to reflect better the interests and priorities of their citizens at domestic level. In this vein, both China and the Middle East countries reject the global liberal, liberal order on two fronts. Um, they claim that the liberal elements granting individual rights to their citizens, um, they, they perceive that they are going against a broader self-defined idea on collective rights. So on the difference between individual and collective rights. And at the same time, uh, they have similar uh, understandings on um, what, what many authors call democratization of politics process. And they have similar stances on, on the democratization of politics stances emanating from the international community. And this is something that they all both feel uncomfortable. Uh, Middle Eastern regimes might bandwagon with China when it comes to facing the effects of the liberal order. So they can articulate a common front with the rising, with the rising superpower um, that could trigger reassertive approaches to the liberal dimension of the liberal order. Um, the contestation of this liberal essence of the global order will be easier by Middle Eastern countries if the rising power in the system also feels uncomfortable with it 
and opts for challenging any of its potential effects. And, and just to conclude, my, 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 the final idea, and this is precisely the one I'm working in, in the last year or so to try to, 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 fully, um, to, 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 to fully nuance it, is that one that uh, after everything I've said so far, I think that what we are witnessing here is that China is becoming what I've called an indirect, sorry, indirect normative power. Uh, unlike what has happened for many, many years with former superpowers um, at the core of the inception of contemporary international norms and, and at the core of the global international order, China might, might be understood as a normative power, not due to the fact that is trying to impose its norms over the rest, but, do, but through this indirect channel in which by using those norms with their relations with the rest, uh, it is creating a whole set of, of new features and parameters that might consolidate over time and, and, and have the uh, potential of representing a broader challenge to the uh, liberal order again. This does not mean that those new, in, those new norms and interpretations might, um, might uh, substitute the contemporary global international order, but rather run in parallel uh, and, and in a way let the rest of the international actors at the international, in the international community to pick and select depending on the situation, depending on the instances, and depending on the fields of on the fields of reality that we are paying attention to, and this is everything I wanted to share with you here today. Thank you for hearing, and obviously I'm open up for questions, comments, and and, and everything else that we are going to be talking about in the coming minutes. Thank you. All right, I think it probably makes sense to do have all the presentations, and then we can since since you guys work together as a panel, and yeah, we can ask questions. Great. Um, I, I guess I'll just uh, start um, after Jordi and then move to Ema. So um, I have read um, one of the several papers um, Jordi mentioned and he's working on. And um, I personally think that um, um, there are a lot of similarities that we observed um, in the region. And I will be mostly focusing um, like a like zoom in um, section of, um, of Jordi, what Jordi mentioned as a um, um, revive um, transnational legal order by focusing on the dispute resolution perspective. I do have some slides um, that I'm going to share. So I'll just to share my screen, um, just a couple of slides. So it's not a complicated presentation, not going to take very long. So, um, so um, the, I have, we have a, we have a draft paper that is pretty drafty right now, um, but basically um, the, the title paper is called Judicial Cooperation, SBRI Transnational Dispute Settling, um, Dis Dispute Settlement, all ordering perspective from Middle Eastern states. Um, so um, I, I consider myself as a dispute resolution scholar and also I'm an arbitration lawyer myself. I, I, um, I'm, I participate in various different cases concerning China and, uh, and other of its trading partners. Um, so I, I have certain amount of experiences in um, commercial dispersolution myself. Uh, what motivated me um, to study um, this um, topic is really that um, as someone who's originated from, China, originated from China and being in a field of dispute settlement for uh, international dispute settlement for years, particularly, I'm particularly interested um, whether and how the Belt and Road um, Initiative has um, has changed or revised and reshaped the transnational legal ordering um, that is initiated from China, but particular from the dispute settlement perspective. Um, I think Jordan has presented a, a very good picture of what happened um, in the Belt and Road, and everyone is basically an expert here in the panel. So just to be very, very brief, um, regarding my own observation of, of the introduction of Belt and Road. So Belt and Road Initiative is basically a strategic initiative that is proposed by the Chinese government. Um, it is a um, investment and trading and connectivity initiative, um, basically by promoting Chinese enterprises from going out, going globally from China um, and encourage them to um, invest in 
a number of identified BRI jurisdictions. But basically, um, the network is relatively loosely developed. So any country that is of particular strategic importance to China's um, political agenda could be considered as a BRI country. Many of BRI countries are located in um, the Middle East, North Africa, um, following the traditional Silk Road. But, um, but this particular BRI um, scheme has been expanding to also include countries in, in um, Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, in um, um, South America, and also Southeast Asia. So it's really a loosely defined term, I would say, what constitute the BRI countries. Um, since, not, not since, from, since the BRI, um, China has really uh, intensified its investment, particularly in infrastructure projects in many of the BRI countries. So this, Paragraph basic. This um, this chart shows a um, general overview of China's investment in many of the important Middle East um, countries. Uh, you can see that most of the, those um, um, investments concerned um, um, trade um, and also uh, infrastructure um, um, projects. Um, so um, so it's it's not deniable. That, um, that China has an increased economic and political presence in the Middle East. In particular, it is a very sensitive time period because of um, traditional Western power, particularly um, in the United States. Um, they have been slowly withdrawing from the, uh, from the Middle East. So there's kind of a power vacuum in the region, even though we know that the United States is also trying to come back to the Middle East, but it's kind of a, a either like a transition of power in the Middle East also, or like a, like a temporary power vacuum in the Middle East. Um, at the same time, um, transnational legal scholars have been identifying or re-identifying China as a um, um, new rule supplier in the transnational legal order by being able to um, supply um, different type of legal norms be filling um, in gaps of international law that was traditionally Western dominated. So that's the basically two big background of this particular research. And I am particularly interested in this interplay of, tra of transnational legal order and dispute settlement. So how dispute settlement has been modified and remodified um, in the China Middle Eastern context due to China's increased economic and political presence in the region. If there's a change, um, there's uh, what other reasons behind the change, or probably it's very minimal legal uh, transnational legal impact. And if the impact is minimal, um, why why is that? Um, there are several reasons that make this. This is a, this is a comparative law um, conference, so I I would like to put the comparative law perspective into context. There are a couple of reasons that make this comparative project very interesting. Um, first of all, um, a lot of similarity uh, in terms of governance structures of China and the Middle, Middle Eastern countries. A majority of them, including China, considered as authoritarian regime, meaning that they are not traditional Western demo democracies, um, making certain kind of legal reform difficult, but other type of legal reforms very easy because of the um, efficacy of the governance system and a very strong centralized power control and also the top-down governance order. Um, second of all, um, China and many of the Middle Eastern countries traditionally are destinations of Western money. So traditionally, they have been receiving foreign direct investment and have been benefiting from um, foreign direct investment. And one particular um, legal um, um, consequence um, of being traditional recipients of Western, uh, Western um, money um, is that uh, many of them have started to conduct legal reforms to accommodate um, to need uh, foreign investors. So this is not only um, um, the change in what, 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 this is not only impacting changes we have seen in an FDI scheme, but also in many other parts of the legal system, um, so such as property law, such as other types of economic laws, and also dispute settlement to regimes. So traditionally, China and also middle, many of the Middle Eastern countries are considered as legal recipients of um, Western legal norms. 
So they have been instituting some of their legal reforms to accommodate needs of, of, of the Westerners and also um, traditionally Uyghur law type of countries. That is the, that, that is the second um, 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 point that really makes the comparison um, interesting. Um, Middle Eastern has a lot of uh, regional integrate, um, integration um, and particular, as I mentioned before, there's certain type of US and China geopolitical tension in the Middle Eastern, also um, adding a, a additional uh, dimension to, um, to this comparison. Um, and, and the first reason that I particularly think that comparison is as interesting is that um, um, what I find very special um, of the Bell and Road Initiative, I think, I think Jordi also touched upon this comment, um, uh, touched upon this uh, this this um, this aspect in his presentation that um, um, there are really not many hard law legal instruments that are in place between China Middle Eastern countries. There are some bilateral investment treaties. There are some treaties and conventions. But really, um, since the initiative, um, since the initiation of Belt and Road. Um, there hasn't been, we haven't witnessed any, any type of increase in number of hard law legal instruments between the two regions. Um, the BRI is basically um, a soft law based mechanism. Um, China is really pragmatic in terms of um, instituting any type of change through the BRI. Um, as um, a Professor Petersman mentioned in one of his recent paper, um, there's really this kind of informal bilateralism. So what I'm also quite interested, um, what, I, what I'm also quite interested in com com comparing is that um, how the role of soft law matters to um, this, this new type transnational legal order between China and Middle Eastern, because it's not like traditionally um, a hard law um, or, international, or international legal instrument initiated order. Um, so that's the background of the research and also basically um, the rough research question for um, this project. Uh, what do I mean by transnational dispute um, resolution order? So traditional trans transnational dispute resolution order normally means international arbitration um, because arbitration has been the main method of resolving international commercial and investment disputes. We're having a lot of um, um, research that, 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 that tries to link transnational in order um, between arbitration, um, which emphasize on um, increased role uh, of merchants, they um, increase demand for the autonomy, um, and um, the communication of transnational legal uh, and transnational legal actors. So people usually associate international arbitration with, um, with trans transnational dispute resolution order. But, um, but has China been supplying a new transnational dispute resolution order through the BRI? Um, in this paper, we think that the answer um, is a negative. Well, I'm not sure how um, Mother Copelis uh, approached this question. Um, so as, as Lori also mentioned, China has been promoting different types of dispute resolution mechanisms um, in, um, together with, with its BRI trading partners, but none of them is um, effective enough to replace any of the existing dispute resolution mechanism. Um, China tries to promote arbitration, mediation. There's a new um, commercial court, but um, from practical perspective, really haven't seen increase in number um, of cases being taken by the China International Commercial Court. Um, we don't we don't know if um, um, any um, of the mediation and, and arbitration um, have started to move um, out of the traditional popular choices of party to um, to be taken to be absorbed by this new transnational district resolution mechanism um, um, proposed by China. So um, I really think that um, in the in the area of transnational dispute settlement currently, um, China hasn't been able to do much with the BRI. Some of the reasons might be um, because um, particular with uh, regarding to Middle Eastern states. Um, they, are, they have already initiated arbitration reforms earlier and mostly really all honored um, a Western style rule of law. So um, it's really hard to draw those parties um, away from their traditional um, top choices of arbitration venues, such as ICC in Paris and also uh, some of the um, Middle Eastern centers themselves, like the center in Dubai and, and Doha, 
So um, we haven't been able to see um, a switch um, of parties' preferences uh, since um, China proposed this BRI initiative. Uh, and then, because we, what we won't be able to find any kind of support from arbitration field, we kind of moved to um, to judgment in, uh, to um, to um, some of the steps China has been taken to promote um, um, bilateral treaties between Chinese judiciary and Middle Eastern judiciary to see if there's any type of convergence practice um, in the field of um, of um, court. Um, um, and initiated dispute settlement uh, mechanisms. So we have been focusing, um, studying the changes in three different countries, UAE, Egypt, and Iran. Um, all of them basically have different kind of existing legal order by either favoring a common law induced um, dispute settlement order or like a more innate kind of, um, or hybridized with Arabic elephants um, dispute settlement mechanism. All of them have a pretty strong institutional support of arbitration, but with the BRI, we do see that all of the courts have been signing um, treaties with Chinese courts uh, and to enhance their judicial collaboration with Chinese courts, particularly in an area of, um, of, of um, recognizing or mutual, uh, we're recognizing um, each other's um, judgment from the courts. So um, we can wonder, so because this is a like ongoing project with, at a pretty early stage, we kind of wonder whether um, this so-called transnational dispute settlement order trying to initiate a, a, by the BRI was actually a new order that is dominated by more centralized judicial organ trying to drive people to resolve their disputes, not by traditional means of arbitration, but really to move back to, um, to courts. Um, um, we don't know if that is the case, but that is something we are trying to propose in the paper. Some kind of explanation we, 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 um, we're trying to pro we, we propose in the paper include maybe there's like a power balance or imbalance, maybe there's certain socialization factors that you see in Middle Eastern as perceiving China in one way or another. There could be some institutional inertia or other cost effective reasons that uh, we, we discussed in the paper. Um, but um, but uh, the main implications I kind of want to um, I want to talk about here and maybe to um, call for some discussions after uh, all the presentations are done is that um, what are the key differences between a BRI induced transnational dispute settlement order and a traditional one? Um, does it have any potential of overhauling existing dispute settlement infrastructure, or um, maybe it's just like an alternative that um, that people can reserve, um, which, which runs parallel with uh, any of the dis existing trans transnational dispute settlement and infrastructure? And I'm also quite interested in the role of government in um, inducing such type of order, because traditionally this type of dispute settlement um, um, all the mechanisms or are really actor induced and whether um, the China factor has uh, shifted the preference of um, parties by resorting to a more top-down kind of structure. So um, this is, I think um, we're, we're here. Um, one difficult, one major difficulty we have been facing during the research stage is that um, we just having a lot of difficult time gathering data because there are not many cases we can study. Um, we have been interviewing people, so transnational legal actors, but haven't been able to gather a lot of hard and solid evidence to back up arguments. So maybe by opening up to discussion, um, we can talk about ways of further uh, supplement some of the research idea we already have here. Okay, I think that ends my presentation here. Great, and we're moving to um, Imad. Um, yeah, Kerry, uh, is there a way to remove the slides? Because I also have a slideshow. Sure. Yeah, if you, if you just end, stop share, then that should. I, okay, yeah. Great. Okay, so I'm just gonna. <laughs> Right, so as a start, so I'm just gonna introduce myself. My name is Imad Ibrahim. I am a research assistant professor at the Center for Law and Development of the College of Law of Qatar University. 
Uh, I spent three years in China previously working on European Commission projects related to climate change and energy. And I've been doing some work on BRI in terms of uh, environmental, environmental governance in places like Central Asia and other places, mainly on water, energy, and food. And so once I came to Qatar and I've seen all these things playing out here and uh, Western withdrawal from the region, it caught my interest to understand how does how would the BRI impact the MENA region from an environmental perspective while taking into consideration trade because I see trade and environment or trade and non-trade concerns as extremely connected. And so based on that, I, was, I'm, I am wondering here, and this is again, initial stages of the project because there are too many data to, to discuss and too many things to think of. And I have too many questions in mind, which I also hope to share that with you. So we try to also figure these out. Um, because in my mind, there is, for instance, recently the, the agreement signed between China and the EU concerning investment, which was recently signed. There is also the work being done between the US and China. So my initial idea would be that China or thesis for this is that China is going to try to use any kind of agreements between the GCC or MENA region countries and Beijing in a way to enhance its influence in the region. Meanwhile, that will impact the Western legal traditions here, which influenced the region since like the last century because of colonialism and other impacts. So that's more or less more broadly what I'm thinking of. Of course, I need to go more deeper into that and that requires more research on the topic, but that's where my interest starts off. So let's start with the beginning. So China has a go West strategy. There is a, there is a lot of investments by Chinese companies in the MENA region, especially in places like Egypt and elsewhere. Uh, these countries, it goes without saying that these countries have huge strategic importance for China in terms of geopolitical and energy security. Uh, China actually imports a lot of conventional energy from places like Iraq and the GCC. We're going to see that later on. And because of that, several cooperation mechanisms have been established. Early, the earliest, like we're recording in 2004. The main area in the region where these kind of cooperation mechanisms were established were the GCC, since the GCC area is the most developed, where with the most connections and cooperation with China. And that's, that's also understood, given that the kind of energy import and export that happens between both regions. So rounds of negotiations between GCC countries and China started since 2004. The idea is to establish a free trade agreement. It's not established yet, but that's sort of the long goal. Of the of both parties. So how what do they what, what does Beijing exactly want in the Arab world? Well, I'm talking here again from an environmental perspective, cooperation on various issues, energy security, agriculture, uh, environmental issues like climate change, water shortage. So from an environmental perspective, these are all issues of interest to China, especially that China is actually witnessing a huge air, water, and soil pollution as a result of fire virus elements, including climate change. So A, China has, at this stage, China has enough expertise to try to, and know-how to try to export that to the rest of the countries, given that they had to deal with that for the last 20 years and still have to deal with that. So that, they can use that as a way to also help these countries and provide that kind of much needed know-how in a region like the MENA region that is expected to suffer from water shortage, a uh, huge impact of climate change, as well as, uh, issues in relation to like population revolutions because of all these elements which are causing unemployment. So if I'm gonna have a question from this research I'm trying to ask is, okay, China is seeking to create free trade agreements with Arab countries. At the initial stage, they need, they're trying to create free trade agreements with the GCC area. And we've seen as like at the EU level, every time the European Union creates an association agreement with another country, there are these kinds of carrots of sticks used by the, EU, by the EU, where they include provisions related to, related to sustainability within these agreements. So a country can benefit from EU funding, for instance, or EU support as long as these provisions are actually respected. So I am wondering, would these FTAs, could these FTAs include these kind of provisions from the, from the Chinese counterparts as to help these countries benefit from their the from the Chinese initiative in terms of environmental governance, while at the same time doing trade through the free trade agreement? That's the question in general I'm asking. It's still very broad. I need to still narrow it down more or even focus on a specific area. But this is, I have been thinking about that for a while and uh, 
And now with what's what happened with the European Union, with the agreement between China and the EU, that that is something that even made things broader because that can even be used as a model to understand how China is actually dealing with other parts, other regions in the world. So that's more or less the question I'm trying to, to reply to. So what kind of free trade agreements China made with Arab countries? Well, for the last decade, two decades, there are very, very several like long-term mechanisms established. And these kind of mechanisms have gained further importance with BRI. So the first thing established was something called the China Arab State Cooperation Forum. That was established in 2004 for ensuring cooperation between, between the GCC or even the Arab and the Chinese part. So since then, numerous conferences take, took place and sort of partnership, it was suggested between the countries to, to have common development, common ideas. And they, even China has a, had a recent China Arab policy paper where they discuss different pillars of cooperation, including one, those on environmental governance. So already China has a strategic importance in the region and that's why there is this kind of interest to try to address how to balance free trade agreements with environmental governance. Meanwhile, take into consideration how would that impact US and European influence. So besides this kind of cooperation, China, as we all know, imports a lot of oil from the region, be it the GCC or Iraq. And we've seen that with a previous presentation in terms of oil import from the region. Uh, we had several rounds of agreements being done or at least negotiated between both countries. They remain very difficult. So the both parties are still, they lack a little bit of trust. It's not the same dealing with like with the European Union or the US. There's a difference of culture between both parties and they still, I would say, need the, they still need a little bit more time to understand each other before an actual agreement like that is created. But so far, negotiations are happening slowly. I would say the recent events in the GCC, like the blockade that happened in the last four or five years, impacted these negotiations because Arab countries were concerned with other stuff, mainly internal affairs. Uh, so the question is, well, that's not a question actually. One would wonder whether how these FTAs between China and GCC will move on because their success or failure would actually impact whether further FTAs are signed between China and other Arab countries and are actually modeled based on that. So what are the environmental pillars of cooperation that China insists on in terms of cooperation with the Arab countries? One, of course, is energy in terms of conventional and renewables. So Arab countries obviously export uh, conventional energy to China in exchange. China exports its renewable energy to the Arab countries in terms of solar panels and in terms of wind energy. And that is extremely important for GCC countries because they're looking, countries like Saudi Arabia and like Qatar, they're looking for energy diversification. And especially that they have the entire desert there. So we, call, we have something called now here, the desert economy, where they're trying to build their entire new economy based on that, trying to benefit from the desert. So it's so far, it's well exchanged uh, of goods and services between, between both, both uh, regions. So they also, China is looking to invest in agriculture. I think they're doing a lot of work in terms of agriculture, trying to export some uh, agriculture from the region, but also investing in places like Egypt or Sudan, actually, where there is like fertile lands to try to actually invest in lands there that given that China also has a big market to feed, a lot of citizens in China requires food and they don't wanna have food insecurity. So it's also a two way street between both, both regions or the China and the MENA region. So again, what are the main issues that are being seen as environmental cooperation between China and the MENA region? Climate change, water, air, soil, uh, other elements of the environment, biodiversity, and even addressing desertification. And there are other elements as well. So again, the question I'm asking, should Chinese cooperation via these free, these free trade agreements provide necessary support for the Arab countries to achieve sustainable development goals? One can answer yes, one can answer no, depending on the argument one may decide to choose. One can argue that the Chinese are all about their interest and they would use these agreements to get what they want from the region without actually benefiting from the region, similarly to what happened in Africa where there was a lot of infrastructure built and a lot of investment in Belt and Road where these investments led to nowhere, while the know-how and I mean the personnel on the, on the floor were actually Chinese 
and not people from those countries, so they'd not benefit from the know-how and learning and expertise. One can make an, a counter argument that in the context of the GCC, China cannot do that because these countries have one of like the highest GDP, GDP per capita. And so they are sort of like obliged to have a sort of uh, same level of co uh, cooperation or negotiation so that both parties can benefit from it. Both arguments are valid. We will have to see if that will take place or not. So other questions I would like to answer or actually I'm trying to ask since the EU in the last 20 or 30 years through its, through its European neighborhood policy, similar to the US with its US aid, for instance, tried to use soft power in the region, trying to use association agreement, even trying to create something called free trade zone between all Arab countries, and then hopefully connecting that to the European single market. Could China try to do that using free trade agreements while balancing that with environmental protection? We don't know, but that's a question there. I would be interested more to discuss, to, to figure out or examine the agreement signed between the EU recently and China to understand on investment, to understand what are the provisions there and whether these provisions can be modeled in the region. But that's like one of the questions I'm trying to reply to. And uh, I don't have yet a, like an actual answer for that. Uh, but these provisions would actually be more pragmatic because there is Chinese interest. There are also Arab interests. So both areas, can take that into consideration and draft provisions that are actually pragmatic, feasible, while considering other interests. So that's more or less the idea. And at the same time, I was, I'm wondering, okay, let's say we created this kind of free trade agreements between China and the Arab world. We had provisions concerning environmental protection and the Arab countries are, have started to actually respect these free trade agreements. What would that be the impact on international trade rules and on WTO? because plenty of these Arab countries are not members to the WTO. And for the reasons that in case they open their markets in accordance with WTO rules, uh, their markets will be flooded with cheap products and their industries will, be, will go bankrupt. And so that, could that kind of free trade agreements like initiate or sort of start as a process for Arab countries in the future to increase their, the competitiveness of their markets to accede to WTO? We would, we would see. It's not, it's not like that's another question that requires a response, but that's like either in the near or the long term future to understand these issues. So, this is how the Arab, Arab countries have sort of an opportunity here to use the Chinese experience as well within the WTO to, uh, to create sort of a sophisticated regime based on which they could at one point accede to the WTO. So, that's also another question to uh, examine. And among the rest of the questions, like these are like sort of a summary of what I have, what kind of questions that we were just discussing. So again, could China help the Arab countries within, the, within like FTAs agreements, having sustainability provisions, uh, addressing environmental governance in the face of climate change? We don't know yet. Should these be used uh, for other areas in the Arab world or even for the WTO to like create a sophisticated regime for the Arab countries? We don't know yet. What's the impact of these kind of agreements or China's soft power, soft power, but also in this case, hard power in case of agreements on US and European legal influence in the region, especially that this influence stems from centuries of colonialism or simply uh, cooperation between both like either the EU, US and the MENA region. All these questions require, require a response. I will have to start from the very simple question, which is uh, should, could this like could we have a free trade agreement between China and the GCC, balancing trade and non-trade concern? So that's more or less the presentation where I'm starting from, and I'm looking forward to your ideas and comments on this to understand what you think of this. So thank you very much. Well, thank you all. Um... I, did you guys have uh, Carrie? I don't know if you wanted to sum up, or I can, I can start. <laughs> no, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I think it's so fitting that this panel is taking place at the University of Wisconsin because this is such a realist panel, and I mean this in the sort of American realist legal tradition, right? It's foregrounding politics in its approach to both um, private and public international law. Um, and in its approach to comparison. So it's, uh, it's quite fitting that it's a te technically Wisconsin this year. Um, and I have some, the, the papers were really interesting. Um, 
I'm probably going to figure out where my research interests lie a little bit pretty quickly. I, um, I read up a comparative pre procedure and arbitration, and I'm working on a research study on the use of traveling judges on domestic commercial courts. So that's <laughs> um, most of what I what I know about um, the region is through that that lens right now. Um, but I will try to um, stop asking, you know, why isn't it relevant to my paper and ask more what's relevant to you? Um, so yeah, where to start? Okay, so I guess, Jordy, um, you're at a law conference. And so um, one question I have, right, as somebody who hasn't had a chance to do her reading um, is, what in particular drew you to that frame, um, looking at legal changes as um, indicative of political changes and how do they help you track um, political influence in the region? Sort of what, what, what do you see as the interplay between the two um, and what indicators might we look at to find indicators of growing Chinese um, political influence? So things like um, adoption of provi uh, provisions that mirror the Chinese model bit in cases beyond um, bits between a, a country and China, maybe we see those moving into model bits that other countries are using as well. Um, or looking at, um, as, as Carrie is doing soft law measures, um, numbers of cases that are decided by various bodies, what would you see as indicative of sort of Chinese political influence on um, international law in the region? Um, and I could, can we, we'll, I'll just go through and then we can discuss amongst ourselves. Carrie, this is such a fascinating project. And of course, <laughs> I'm gonna say that to just be resolution true, but, um, so many different ways you could go with this. Um, one, one note I just had though was disaggregate Western because the US is a much newer entrant to the region um, than European powers. And that affects a lot of things. Like it's not, US law is pretty much absent. It's all English law. When you're talking about legal reforms, it's Engl adoption of English law with the one um, exception of the Dubai World Tribunal, which adopted English law and then when that failed, um, went to the U.S. bankruptcy statute and transposed that. Um, but it's 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 really a lot of these have been um, choices around at least what I've seen in the special economic zones, right? Adopting English legal instruments, common law, in jurisdictions that are historically Islamic, right, with some French influence, but um, primarily Islamic law, and then importing uh, with that English judges um, and English practitioners, right? Who are flying into the region to do these cases driven by a perception that the financial services companies that they want in these zones want English law and write English law into their contracts. So um, I think it's, it's you know, it striking for us when we were doing the survey, there are no American lawyers involved at all. Right, it's all English, um, and and Singaporean and Malaysian, but no, nobody from the U.S. Um, but uh, it's in, it's in, uh, Australian, Hong Kong. Um, so that's you know useful to do um, in terms of questions about you know where where are these disputes going, um, and I it's so frustrating to research in this area for just the reasons you mentioned. But one question I had is whether you would see anything in Singapore. Because it seems like Singapore is trying to position itself as a sort of lawmaker in the common law commercial world. Um, and there's certainly some interchange between um, the Singap Singapore International Commercial Court and the International Commercial Court's in the Middle East um, in terms of personnel. Um, so that might be an interesting place to, to look. So what, what's Singapore's role in all of this and how is Singapore reacting 
um, to the BRI if it is at all. Um, it may be also that they're sort of not affected, <laughs> that this, this area is not affected by it. Um, and when you're looking at the, uh, use of um, judgment enforcement treaty. So that goes along with the adoption of new courts, right? That all of a sudden we need to worry about judgment enforcement because we don't have the New York convention. Um, so one question is what do those actually get you? Um, was that ever a serious concern? And um, do you see any reference to them by either side? I mean, th this is a problem where there's a very few cases, right? Um, both in the new SEZ courts in the Middle East, in, in the UAE specifically, and, and um, Qatar, and also very little from the uh, China International Commercial Court. So I'm, may, I'm not sure if there's anything there yet, but that would be an interesting place to look is, is whether they're being referenced. Um, and Imad, so this is like further from my area. Yeah, so I may, I may be speaking out of ignorance um, here, but I think that your instinct to look at what's in the FTAs makes sense. And one question is, what would you expect to see? Because for the EU, right, there's a, there's a, the trade policy sort of complements other area, like the rhetoric that you see in other areas of EU foreign policy um, that's putting an emphasis on um, the environment. And of course, there's a lot of political push within the EU for that emphasis. Um, do you see the Ministry of Foreign Affairs making similar statements? Um, like, you know, based, based on what you're seeing from Chinese politics, what would you expect to get expressed um, in the FTAs? So I guess that those are some questions that came up for me and you probably have questions for each other, but this is really cool. Jordi, would you like to? Yeah, answer? sure. I can open fire. So uh, thank you so much for the comments. Uh, thank you so much for the rest, for all your presentations. Uh, as, as Alisa has said, uh, I see the clear, obvious connection among everything we've said. That there is a clear threat connecting or share interest. Um, addressing the question on the interplay of law and politics, this is kind of one of my personal obsessions. Uh, it's something I myself struggle uh, with. So um, the the initial answer on to that question on where could I, where could where would I expect to see something happening in that respect, I would say that um, the first time we see a, an Arab or a Middle Eastern state uh, putting forward an interpretation in disputes with other Middle Eastern states that mimics Chinese arguments uh, or uses these same interpretations to uh, when presenting their arguments in a dispute with other globally states, um, I would say that something is happening in that respect. That I would expect this norm diffusion slash norm accommodation to be seen by, by the incorporation of those narrative elements into the construction of arguments in dispute settlement uh, within the region and with the region, with the rest of the world, not with China precisely. Um, when I see uh, when I see Lebanon using the Chinese doctrine in in straight lines in the definition of its territorial sea to uh, to make its case against Israel. I would say, well, this is taking shape. This is finally taking shape. Uh, China uh, has, 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 has had this indirect normative power that I'm talking about here. When I see a Middle Eastern International Law Commission member advocating for the adoption of a specific set of norms uh, by the international community, mimicating the 
um, the narrative or, or the underpinning uh, interpretation that China has over a specific issue, I would say, well, here's, here I see what, 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 what I'm talking about. All in all, my, my basic point, and I think I should have said that clearly uh, in a clear fashion, is that um, in many instances, Middle Eastern countries uh, do not feel fully entitled when it comes to dealing with international law in the sense that they feel that they have not been fully incorporated into the into decision making and the inception of international law as such. Hmm? They feel as, as, as marginalized in that respect, so they don't feel as, as, as real actors in the definition and implementation of international law. So I, I get the impression that the more China uh, proposes alternative interpretations to some norms, they might be they might feel really comfortable with just following that path and accepting that interpretation to to actually express what they might actually think about some of those elements in international law, and this connects my argument with something that uh, Carrie mentioned in her presentation, and I would like to make a general uh, to share with you a, a general feeling in that respect. I think that is also important that we pay attention to. Uh, what we could call extra law solutions, hmm? not only to solve law, but also extra law solutions. And what do I mean by that? When you were asking yourself about the impact of soft law and, and, and the, the preference that uh, regional actors have on, on, on using soft law instead of, of hard law or any other mechanism, I think that, there is a, that we have to accept that there is a broad regional rejection to participating in new hard law instruments. But not only that, there is also a reality in which they prefer to conduct the regional relations, avoiding law as an instrument. Hmm? So um, for us, sometimes it's really difficult to think beyond law, hmm? as we are obviously studying law or, par or partially we're studying law. But, uh, but um, in many occasions, what China and the Middle Eastern countries share is that politics are preferred to law. And I think that this also applies to dispute, uh, to dispute mechanisms. Hmm? I think that uh, in, in the upcoming future, when we see Chinese companies having disputes with Middle Eastern companies, we might expect um, uh, these disputes to be settled through political means, not necessarily judiciary nor law means. Mm -hmm. I, I think that uh, this is something that we need to pay attention to, like I said, extra law solutions that might be in place. And this is why, and this is a personal impression, I don't have like, um, strong data or I've not, I've not conducted a strong research to, 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 to justify this, but I have the impression that this is precisely why nor China nor Middle Eastern countries are really, um, are really up for fully developing normative environments on settling disputes. Mm -hmm. So it's not really necessary for them because there is a source and some, uh, some sort of social acceptance that if any such disputes might rise, they might go for uh, alternative channels to uh, for, for answering to those pro to those problems. There's a pin in that. How much is that a Chinese trend versus a global reevaluation, um, particularly of investor state dispute resolution right now? So Canada and the U.S. got rid of investor state yep. dispute resolution. Um, one of the reasons was the U.S. has never lost a NAFTA case, so Chinese Canadian <laughs> companies were not benefiting. <laughs> um, uh, and it I'm was sure, sort of yeah. the reaction was, well, it's all going to be political anyway. I'm sure this fits in an overall general global trend. I have the impression that, especially when it comes to the Middle East itself, they have never been really comfortable with that. Huh? Uh, uh, even when it comes to with uh, European companies in the region, we have seen that... Um, Middle Eastern countries have been really reluctant over the years. Uh, they've never had the position to uh, clearly state and put forward the, the, the fact that they don't want to use those mechanisms. But I think that if China is offering them this possibility, they might take, they might take good advantage of that. I don't know if this makes sense and if this resonates with your own research and your opinion. Um, I need to intervene here for one second for what uh, Corti said concerning the Arab countries' uh, sort of neutrality concerning international law. And I'm speaking as an international lawyer who came back to the region after 10, 10 years of what it being 
all over the world from west from the west to china i can i would say that unfortunately the main reason why arab countries are not involved in international law is because there are no international lawyers competent enough to do that and i'm speaking as an international lawyer because i can see that there is a lack of international lawyers or people who actually understand international law who are arabic speakers and this is like i am already working at one of the second best universities in the region and i could see that um, maybe there's a second person in the entire university who's an arabic speaker who understands the like international law uh, who has an idea about what's happening at international level and that stems as well from a lack of research abilities in the sense that the arab professors or, or like arab scholars have never actually the majority of them have never actually studied in the west they still come from arabic tradition in terms of studies so they have no idea about how to do research in a certain way that you create originality or understand the various legal fields so that affects uh, like western arab sorry arab perception of international law how can an arab country influence international law if international if arab legal scholars do not understand international law themselves so and those who understand it, there are a few people who study in the West are actually um, kept aside from the governments because they don't like their position. So especially when it comes to like water resources, transparent water governance. Uh, I know several experts, for instance, who are Sudanese or Egyptians who studied in the West who are very influential, but their governments do not use their expertise because they, they take a neutral position and try to solve the countries, the, the conflict. So they're not political. And that's how that's what that's that's one of the main reasons. So. Mm -hmm. I might really agree with you, Matt, in, 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 with everything you said, but uh, I've had the chance to have similar conversations in the past, and I always highlight something that I think is important in that respect. Um, if we talk about the Middle East in general, this argument that you're putting forward doesn't take, I think, into account um, how private actors have been really... Um, have been properly using international law in that respect. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if the city group, if Dubai port, if DP World, Dubai Port World has a conflict with any uh, American company, uh, they have all the means of, and, and they know they, they, they can hire the knowledge from global um, from, from global law firms that have been able to defend those Arab interests worldwide. So in that sense, my point is that. This might be something happening at the public level uh, when it comes to, 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 to international mm -hmm. public law, but international private law is, is another totally different story. Well, but these, but these companies or the people working in these companies remain uh, non-Arabs, which means they will eventually get back to their own countries and they will not create a sort of Arab jurisprudence or international legal scholars who in the long term will do that. I agree with you. And I've seen that in the blockade here in Qatar where uh, Western professors at my university were hired by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to, to mm -hmm. have cases against like Bahrain and Yemen. Yeah. So I can yeah. see that. So, but mm -hmm. they're not creating a know-how and knowledge that actually Arab scholars are benefiting from. And that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's a shame. But that's yeah. a yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess we're starting to see like very much a comparative lens. <laughs> they were across the, out of the panel already. Really enjoyed the, uh, the dialogue we're having also um, Alicia's comments. So, um, just to respond very quickly, I think we have, how much time do we have left? I just think that we have become very immersed in the conversation. Um, we have until, so um, we have about another 25 minutes by mine. Right. Yeah, sounds Plus. good. We can always uh, finish early if we want. Um, right, so basically with regarding to um, Jordi's point on, on law um, and um, legal and after legal kind of research approach, I definitely agree with you that if like a top, like adopt a, like a more extra legal approach, maybe the, 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 the uh, conclusion them having might be a little bit different or more influential. But the thing is that have to be, I, I'm also very struggling with the type of um, journals I'm, I'm targeting, right? I mean, if I'm, I'm not a political science or, or IR scholar, so um, if um, I, I'm aiming for a law review, then they will probably want like more, much more nuanced legal analysis comparing to um, only be talking about actual legal factors. So that's something to have to bear in mind, although I kind of agree with you. And also, um, I think Ima kind of alluded to this point a little bit um, already in his response. I also feel that when I am speaking with um, scholars in the Middle East, um, um, regardless of if they are overseas returnees or if they are like more kind of trained in their own, 
legal culture, I do feel that the kind of um, the type of resistance um, um, in their narrative that if you are accusing them or alleging that uh, Middle East hasn't been like a very active player or can root complier um, in the international law regard, I, I, feel, I feel that there's very kind of strong resistance, um, at least in part of them, like not trying to accept that. I, I feel the same um, about Chinese scholars, especially for those who like a trend in China that they, many of them do think that China is a very good international law complier, even though that's kind of not the, the general consensus um, you are having internationally. So so because I'm, I'm collaborating with a Middle Eastern scholar, so I have to be very cautious <laughs> with that <laughs> um, um, as well. So that's kind of my two responses to Jordan's comment, even though I kind of agree with you myself, I do, I do feel there's kind of um, compromise, like as co-authors, we have to take in respecting each other's uh, legal tradition and approach. Um, um, but but I, I think I think those things are something I can bear in mind. And if I'm going to expand the paper, very likely in the future to be um, incorporating more uh, from the actual legal perspective. I'm not sure if this is a global trend, though. I feel that China is quite trying to like sugarcoating itself as um, or, or trying to legitimize a lot of this approach of um, 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 international, especially in recent years, by uh, towards like a stronger approach um, of legalize some of its norms um, and also um, trying to advocate for more like rule of law or rule by law approach. Um, it doesn't really matter if people um, believing what China is doing um, or not. I, I just think that this is the general kind of narrative um, kind of dominating in China uh, among Chinese scholars, including those Chinese scholars who are writing in English. So that's kind of my my um, my observation um, in that regard. Um, in responding to um, Elisa's question, yeah, I, I, do, I do notice this kind of English lawyer versus American lawyer's presence um, or lack of presence uh, in a Middle Eastern country, especially in Dubai, which is a very developed jurisdiction, but at, at, at other times also feel that whether we're kind of focusing too much in Dubai when we're talking about uh, legal transplant or legal recipient in the Middle East. I mean, I have some data um, about China's bilateral relationship in the Middle East. I, I feel that Dubai isn't, or the entire UAE might not be as important as we think um, in terms of China's overall strategy in the Middle East, but just Dubai, like it's, it's always the headline of international legal news. We're having kind of um, um, being um, swayed by the high, the, the, um, high importance of, of Dubai. So I, 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 I'm, I'm even wondering if Dubai should become one of the um, jurisdictions in my case study, or if I should be moving to like a like another um, jurisdiction um, in terms of doing my case study, um, because we kind of observe different trends in like Egypt and Iran versus a more like westernized jurisdiction like Dubai. Um, uh, another thing that I'm trying to think um, of is also the kind of the different player trying to take over Middle East. Not sure if Imad agrees, but, uh, but you do see this kind of competition um, of Western law, Western rule of law, and and the China initiate order um, being, <laughs> being- English law. <laughs> yeah. US law is not yeah. there. <laughs> Very much. Um, so I, I think this is what makes the paper interesting and difficult. Um, whether there's like a re renewed order or China is being pragmatic and trying to um, propose like alternative order by trying to um, persuade its trading partners to be focusing on judicial collaboration instead. I think that would be something quite interesting to, to um, discuss in my paper. It's a, it's a direction I'm currently taking. As yeah, well. So one question with that is how much is that coming from the Chinese side versus um, courts in the Middle East that have also been pretty aggressive about pursuing mm -hmm. judicial cooperation agreements internationally? Uh, I'm actually not sure. I haven't been able to, to, to see much of the background being discussed. Usually you see like a kind of court saying that they have been signing this judicial cooperation with another court. Um, in terms of Iran and China, which just said, this is quite atypical because you add a enforcement recognition of judgment treaty to a economic partnership treaty. I think that's quite, that's not a very conventional thing to do. So not sure about Iran, maybe Iran was pushing something, maybe China was like pushing Iran to do it, but that's 
that's something that is really hard to get to um, behind the curtains thing. <laughs> so I haven't really been saying much, but I think that's a very good question. And maybe something we can we can start to. So there's, um, a, there's like a Gulf Judgment Enforcement Treaty that might also be a model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. So that's something that's quite interesting as well. Um, as far as for the uh, prediction of Singapore and Hong Kong, because I practiced arbitration in Hong Kong um, before uh, joining um, Big Academy, so I kind of, I kind of have like real um, knowledge of, <laughs> of things being down there. I think both Hong Kong and China uh, and Singapore are trying to position themselves as good dispute resolution venues of China Middle Eastern disputes. Um, I'm not sure if it matters whether those new commercial courts matter or if it's due arbitration mechanism that's going to take um, a lot of the um, cases. And I'm really not sure how that fits into the transnational legal order I am trying to discuss here because normally I don't see, is there like a framework people can use to um, describe this kind of influence on a third mutual menu by <laughs> Well, okay. I mean, this is where you get into questions, right? Because one thing you can do where you have judgments is you can do citation studies, mm -hmm. right? And you can see if there's a shift. Mm -hmm. um, where you have publicly traded companies, you can look at dispute resolution clauses. Yeah. yeah. You know, have they chosen the forum? Um, yeah, nobody's really choosing the SICC yet. They're all getting thrown in there by mandatory jurisdiction. <laughs> um, Interesting to look at as well. Yeah. But yeah, that I, the, I'm. I'm, I've seen some some good examples of um, citation studies, but you can also obviously do those badly. And with arbitration, it's really hard because yeah. yeah. If you don't mind, get in touch after this yes. panel. Mm -hmm. If you have some good papers to recommend, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had to email. <laughs> All right. So I think there's something like I I need to mention before I'm, I answer the questions, and I think we did not mention this, so it's important. So I've been doing research on China BRI in the context of water resources in the Mekong and in the Central Asia. And what I found is that China's approach, if it's very pragmatic in the sense, China's approach is one country, one treaty. So China is not focusing on trying to establish, to like use international law, but rather still be in like in a driver's seat in this regard through this one country, one treaty and not using international tribunals even in case uh, these tribunals will not suit the Chinese interests. That was extremely obvious in the case of, of in the South China arbitration case between China and Philippines where the Chinese didn't even really care about what's happening there. So uh, I think this is a very realistic approach just to try to connect that with uh, the questions of uh, Alisa concerning Chinese and Europeans, which one is more successful. Uh, Chinese approach stems from being pragmatic and realistic. What do they want to do? how they want to do, do, do things, which way to get the results. Meanwhile, Europeans, I have the impression, it's more like sort of an idealism. And that's, I got that impression while living in Europe as well. So if the first question I want to reply to, what do I expect to see in the FTAs? Uh, I expect to see a lot of strong uh, sort of compromise, like provisions where a lot of compromises are being done between China and the EU. Uh, in the sense that I give you this and you give me this, and we are all happy in a certain way. Uh, although I, I did not examine the, the FTA yet, I would assume that plenty of provisions uh, include direct or indirect or implicit or explicit things that not both parties were trying to get and they had to do it, frame it this, the way they did. So I'm pretty sure the agreement will be subject to a lot of criticism from scholars from both parties. And we will have to see exactly its practical implementation to see what, what would be the impact of that. Uh, I have no idea yet, but at least European Union as a whole can have this kind of conversation with China uh, because it's like a, one of the bigger, strong, like one of the strong, like the, the strong economic blocks in the, in the world. So China, EU, US. So that is possible from an economic perspective. In the MENA region, if I connect that to the second question concerning uh, how do you see Chinese getting involved here com in comparison with the European Union, I would say they would try to learn from the mistakes and failures of the European neighborhood policy that the EU has been trying to establish for the last 20 years in terms of association agreements, FTAs, all these things, all the money and funding that came from the EU over the region, which half of it was not used, or if it was used, like there are no actual implementation practices. To give you an example, in Lebanon, 
a child, the EU built 11 or 12 uh, recycling factories to try to recycle garbage. And uh, since then, they have never been used. And when I tried to, like, when I answered, when I asked the European like officer a question about that, they had no idea that this is happening. So European investment money is being spent, and they don't know exactly where this money is going and what, where there's no accountability. Despite the fact that there is a European Commission, there is a European delegation in Lebanon, they have no idea what's happening there. And it's their money. So I don't see the Chinese doing the same thing. Uh, and I don't see the Chinese as well. Uh, they, they will learn from that and they will ask for immediate re like returns. I hope the Arab countries will learn from the expertise and experience of other countries with China. So not to have places like Sri Lanka where the entire ports there now are under Chinese control because of the debt or having entire countries in Africa switching their currency to, to Yuan because they cannot handle the debts they also well, like went under. I see that possible with the GCC countries. I don't see, unfortunately, African, like Northern African countries or even Middle Eastern countries able to negotiate with China. So I see a GCC at a better position, but not Middle Eastern countries or North African in this regard. And I, I, I would be afraid that in particular in the Middle East, that sort of combination of Russian and Chinese influence will be used to market the Belt and Road, especially in the context of Syria, to rebuild Syria where there's a huge competition taking place right now between Western companies and Chinese companies, not a little bit of Russian companies, because there's like expectations of $40 billion of worth of investment in Syria to rebuild the country. And that's all money that will have to come from somewhere and somebody has to benefit from that. And so we can already see the competition taking place there from a realistic perspective. So I can see the Chinese better than the Europeans in this regard because they're more pragmatic, yes. If, if I may, really quick. So um, um, just a suggestion for Kari, where you were talking, when you were talking about uh, Dubai courts mm -hmm. or bringing the example of Egypt or Iran, mm -hmm. I think that if we are taking a look at the broader Middle East, mm -hmm. I think that the Israeli case is also really interesting in mm -hmm. the sense that, they, they, I mean, uh, there were tough negotiations between Chinese authorities and obviously Israeli authorities. The Israelis were not willing to accept some of the things proposed by them. And, and, and obviously they were looking for uh, really hard law mechanisms for uh, mm. protecting any investment and, and making everything clear before joining or signing any, any paper they have in front of them. So if you're not talking about only Arab states or, um, but instead you're talking about the Middle East, the Israeli case might also be really interesting. Uh, and, and, and in that respect, um, uh, another general, an, another comment that I've heard repeatedly in Arab capitals is the following when it comes to this, to settlement, this, to dispute settlement mechanisms. Um, and it's something that we need to keep in mind. They, they are really, they keep always in mind that many of the Chinese companies that might uh, be associated with the Belt and Road Initiative are ultimately public companies owned by the Chinese government itself. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is something really important. So uh, many know that they might not have the room for going for settlement disputes mechanisms yeah. uh, because ultimately what they will have to do if any dispute arises is directly talk to the Chinese government. So I think that the that the nature of the companies themselves in these cases is something really important to take into consideration when, th when thinking about uh, the efforts uh, put forward to materialize uh, mechanisms for dispute settlement. Thanks, Jordi. That's a great piece of advice. We haven't, yeah, we haven't been looking at um, the characters of public, of, of the types of companies that are participating in those disputes. I think that's a great direction. Interestingly, that I was invited to speak um, at a China-Brazil arbitration conference um, this week. And it, it, what, what interests me there is that actually there are a lot of, are there a couple of China-Brazil, I mean, di disputes that are uh, taking place in Brazil involving um, Chinese state-owned companies. So uh, I asked about, I asked Brazilian um, practitioners why that, that might be the case. Um, I think many, many of them were telling me that because there's a mandatory law in Brazil requiring or asking their Brazilian companies to only be accepting arbitration if they can arbitrate in Brazil and their Brazilian law and in Portuguese. 
So I'm not sure if there's similar law in the Middle Eastern countries. If, if no, then that would be something um, very interesting to, to compare and to, and to consider. So yeah, I think the characters of, um, of um, a companies are important. And also that might be another reason that it's easy for China to institute a more like court um, um, centered order. Well, this might be where you really need to chop up the region into like Arab world versus yeah. Persian versus um, North Africa, right? Because I would expect it's that getting long with long. Iran, you have a lot of SOEs as well, yeah. right? Yeah. You have a ton of SOEs. Mm -hmm. So if it's SOE versus SOE, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, negotiating the dispute resolution clause, it's going to look very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. There's um, Turkey in the equation as well, then we can't yeah. forget Turkey. Yeah, right. Which is going to have a whole different, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's really not manageable. <laughs> no, no, but, but, but curiously enough, in this case, the non-Arab countries of the Middle East are far more interesting than the Arab countries themselves. Agree, oh, agree, oh, yeah. So I think that this is something really important here. Yeah. Um, Iman, just one, one uh, comment to your uh, paper. I'm not, I mean, I've been writing something about investment treaties. I'm not an expert on investment law at all. But just an um, um, observation is that even like, there's like a general trend for investment treaties to be adding like more like SDG provisions. And do you see like a striking difference between Chinese approaches and EU approaches or, or China's just trying to follow or, or mock up what other countries are already doing there? Chinese approach, the problem with the Chinese approach is that there is no Chinese approach. It's very flexible. <laughs> there, there is no treaty there. <laughs> that's that's, that's, that's their, their, their power in that. They don't have a treaty, they go, that, that's I mean, there I is a model from. bit. Yeah, but yeah, it's like, but, it's one country, one yeah, yeah, it's we'll, like yeah. being flexible, but not being flexible. We do things as we go, uh, as we see fit. I've seen that in Central Asia, and that's the way, the way it's like, this is the closest place to have the Belt and Road there with all the stance countries, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, all these countries there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just, we go, we, we do the deals with them, there's water, being shared, okay, we have an agreement on this, and but we are very flexible, so it's gonna be very general, but so we can play within the agreement to do whatever we want. So mm -hmm. it's really not the European way of doing things at all. And uh, <laughs> so I think the, yeah. the, the, the strength there is the flexibility, the, the, the way they're doing it in a very flexible way as to take into consideration all the interests and being open to, mm -hmm. to changes. Well, it seems like you're also dealing with non-democracy to non-democracy, mm -hmm. right? So the mm -hmm. European Union is constrained by its parliament. Mm -hmm. um, Israel would be constrained, although <laughs> asterisks on that would be, be right? <laughs> It'd be somewhat more con more political and constraints in terms of agreeing to something but to where you question, can't take it back to MPs and tell them what it is. Sorry for interrupting you. Sometimes the network. Um, uh, <laughs> but but to me, the interesting thing here is whether or not this can survive over time. Because I have the impression, especially after uh, talking with people in Beijing, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that in a way, uh, there's some sort of naive approach in, in, by which they think nothing is going to happen, no dispute is going to arise. So I don't know if this kind of approach might survive after the initial rounds of disputes. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways, it seems okay. to me that, uh, I don't know how to put it, but uh, I don't think they're they asking these questions, Sorry, uh, Imad, I didn't hear you well. I don't think they care. I mean, just look at the Philippines and the yeah. case with China. <laughs> but, but they would only are... care if they would only care if the country is, has a very strategic influence with similar power. If you have a power it's asymmetries between China and the other country, mm -hmm. they will do the deals under the table and to get for instance, without the courts. So. We have a clear example in the region, and this is Iran. Mm -hmm. Iran might, might, might fit in that position that you're talking about, huh? the specific strategic interest, especially after the end of the GCPOA and the, and the oil deals that are going on mm -hmm. right now between China, uh, how China is not paying attention to US sanctions in that respect, and how Chinese firms are pumping the oil out uh, without uh, paying any attention to none of the, of the sanctions in place. Uh, not all the countries fit in, in that picture, but I think that at least some of the countries in the region might might not be Thailand in that respect. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, if you look historically, right, oil, mm -hmm. oil was the impetus for a lot of mm -hmm. law reform attempts. Interesting. But still, Iran is under Chinese mercy because of U.S. sanctions on Iran. Mm -hmm. The only place in the mm -hmm. world, the market that is willing to accept Iranian oil, is China and Russia. 
So effectively, China well, is Russia. Russia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think Iran is a great destination to or, or a country for a case study for any type of China direct influence in the Middle yeah. East. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I would pick up Iran as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I wish um, Nima could have joined us because she's an Iran expert, but um, mm -hmm. um, but it looks like something's going on there. But um, but really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> yeah, Thanks. this is fascinating. Um, and you know you have my email, so I'm I'm interested in in seeing papers as they develop. And definitely, thanks so much. Being Alicia. in touch. Thank you, guys. Thank you, so, thank you so much, everyone. I hope that we can find a way to move forward. I don't know how, <laughs> uh, but, but I, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, there is some sort of connecting thread here that we need to kind of explore, yeah. further explore. I don't know how, but. Open we are working on something, just to let you know, Jorge, we are working on something, and we've been doing that with Kerry for the last two, three months. Mm -hmm. So we will we'll be in touch with everybody. Now, I've seen Alyssa's mm -hmm. interest, so yes, that would be great to have her also. Yeah, we will, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that's, that's great. Fearless Thank you so much. Uh, moderator right. telling yeah. us that we're out of time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you, you still have like three minutes, so I mean, if you want to stretch it out, I mean, we have three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we will, we will do it um, the next occasion. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's great. I know it's getting really late in, in Ama. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but only well, good night. Thank you for staying up. <laughs> <laughs> only the dinner right. time is finished. But, have a good day. Right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Stay in touch. Bye. All done. And meeting for all. Oh, hold on. Yeah, uh, stop the recording.